before giving the floor to our speakers, uh, please allow me to introduce them to you. Uh, they are members of the IPE, Interprofessional Education Team, uh, which groups um, teachers in the medical technology and health programs at Dawson College. Um, so today we have four speakers. Tim Miller has been a member of the physiotherapy technology department since 2013. He's heavily involved in the IP uh, team and he acts as a project lead. Krista Bulo is a teacher in the physiotherapy technology program. She's a physiotherapist by trade. She loves the challenge of teaching in the specialized field. And having worked in a variety of healthcare settings, she's seen firsthand how team dynamics across professions can make or break a patient's experience. Sharon Clegg is a physiotherapist and she's helped to create the physiotherapy technology program at Dawson. She's been teaching in this program for the past 10 years and her previous employment includes the Montreal Children's Hospital where she developed her passion for interprofessional education. And lastly, Marie-Ève Dufour is a professional social worker who's direct practice in the health and social service network, working with individuals as well as families, has inspired her teaching and motivated her involvement in the interprofessional education team at Dawson. So um, please uh, do not hesitate to comment and suggest using the discussion module and ask your questions using the Q&A module. Have a good webinar, everyone. So good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming today. We are quite excited to present to you what we've learned so far in taking on this thing called interprofessional education at our CGEP. Uh, we've made lots of mistakes. We've learned a lot of things. And uh, we're now at the point where we're interested in sharing some of these lessons learned um, so that other CGEPs, other colleges, other schools can learn from our mistakes and learn from what we have discovered works really, really well and what doesn't work very well. The whole concept of interprofessional education, as you heard in the introductions of the team, is not something new. It's something that happens in the workforce. Uh, a lot of us have worked in hospital settings and have worked in interdisciplinary or interprofessional teams and know the value of collective work, of collaborative practice. And so as professionals teaching in these programs, we knew we had to bring in some more opportunities for our students to practice these things. In doing so, we dove deep into some research into what interprofessional education is. We defined what it is at our school, and then we hit the ground running with a bunch of activities as well as frameworks to design activities. And so in the next hour, we're going to share lots of different things, including these lessons learned, but more importantly, some of the frameworks that we've designed, that we've tested, we find them to be quite robust, quite strong. We've um, modified them throughout our test phase, and you'll see that some of the activities we've come up with are now running multiple years in a row, and we've been able to um, fine tune them really nicely and rinse and repeat these activities and these opportunities for students so that at the end of their three years, they have more opportunities to practice collaborative practice and practice collective competence. And we feel strong to say that they are more ready to take on some of these uh, roles that they take on in the hospital, specifically working with multidisciplinary teams. So that's the hope for today. The goal uh, at the beginning is to highlight through a story we love telling stories. So here's the story we felt would best capture in our minds at Dawson what interprofessional education is. And the story goes as follows. It takes place about a year ago. The scenario is in a physiotherapy technology lab. We have an activity in uh, physiotherapy technology where as students learning how to treat patients need to learn 
all sorts of uh, manual therapy, including massage therapy. And so it dawned on us as a team of interprofessional education teachers, here's an opportunity for students to interact on something specific to physiotherapy technology, but yet still give students in other disciplines an exposure to uh, physiotherapy technology. And so if you can picture the room is set up, there's lab, there's a, a treatment tables all set up in the lab space. We have our physiotherapy technology students practicing their skills on students from other disciplines in the sector. So the story we're gonna highlight is an interaction between a physiotherapy technology student and a student from our biomedical laboratory technology program. And I was able to witness this sort of secondhand. I was listening in on the conversation, but the students didn't know that I was hearing their conversation. So there's two layers to what was happening. The first was the goal of the activity. The students were exchanging on the concepts of massage therapy. The biomedical laboratory technology student was asking questions on why is this important for your patients? How is it helpful for their rehabilitation? And so on, all the while receiving and feeling the treatment. In addition, the physiotherapy technology student was able to answer these questions and in the tone that the biomedical laboratory technology student would receive them. That was the first layer of conversation, which achieved one of the objectives of the activity. The second uh, layer of the conversation was that the students were actually exchanging on a common case study that they were uh, given as part of another interprofessional education opportunity, where all students in their third semester across all our seven programs uh, contribute to the same case study. And you're going to hear about this case study later on in our presentation. The, the patient's name is Sarah Lynn, and she has breast cancer. And so part of this activity, I won't get into it too much just yet, but part of this activity is for each discipline to contribute to the case study. And so the students were conversing about the, the overlap that they had on the same patient. And I remember uh, being involved with the IPE team parking that and saying, this is a great example of where we are at as a college with this approach, we've been able to integrate multiple activities, multiple opportunities for the students, so much so that the overlap between all of these students and in all of these, all of these programs and the frequency of their interactions is high enough that there's more than just one thing to talk about amongst disciplines. They're now talking about multiple cases that they're working on collectively. So we felt that that was a good example to indicate where we are now, to take a step back, how did we get here, is what we're going to get into in our opening. So just to give you another quick heads up of what we plan to share with you today, we have the presentation sort of captured in three different sections. First is testing the waters. Back in 2018, you're going to hear in a few minutes what we decided to take on and how we decided to go about it. Next, after that, we're going to dive deeper. You're going to hear directly from the teachers who've implemented some of these activities, some of these opportunities for the students, and what we've learned by doing so. And then near the end of the presentation is what we want to call the open ocean. Uh, to navigate right now in this world of interprofessional education across uh, the CJEP network is quite exciting in our minds because we see lots of opportunity for us not just alone in our own college, but across the network to share some of the things that we've learned. And we know that there are other schools trying to implement similar type projects, similar type opportunities. And so we feel confident uh, that there are opportunities for us to collectively work together. And in addition, try and design what we like to call a meta program. So we have all of these multiple medical technology, social service health programs but in addition, design a meta program where at strategic and uh, very uh, targeted moments, students are interacting amongst each other on common uh, activities, on common case studies tied to competencies within their individual programs. So uh, testing the waters is our first phase and I believe I'm now ready to pass along the baton to my colleagues. Yes, to Sharon. Correct. Yeah. So what is interprofessional education? So if we move to the next slide, the World Health Organization talks about it existing when two or more professions learn 
from and about each other to improve the quality of care. And so it's wonderful to know that things that we've done in the past um, that made sense, right? It makes uh, common sense that when you learn, let's say a medical student will learn, okay, what is a physiotherapist? What is an occupational therapist? What is a social worker? What do nursing do? That it makes sense as they learn about that, the quality of care for the patient will improve. And so now we actually have literature to back this up over the last uh, 10 to 20 years. And we also have to look at the patient as a whole. And so interprofessional education also makes us realize as you're not just seeing the person as the knee or the heart patient, right? It's the all encompassing and comprehensive healthcare approach that we're looking at. Um, and again, that was backed up by Bridges in 2011. So we're looking at the holistic approach, which again, only happens when all the different health professionals take their place and do what they're actually meant to do. And so why we introduce this in student level, right, is as the students can learn more about what their profession is and an understanding of what the other professions are, then they can work more effectively and comprehensively as a team. And so right now here at Dawson, we're, we're more limited to what our health programs are. Um, but then even in our classroom last week, I had one of the students present about so physiotherapy technology. So what is an athletic therapist, a kinesiologist, a chiropractor, an osteopath, an occupational therapist, and how does that differentiate then in a, in a patient's care? Um, and last but not least, we want to think about what is going to be best for the patient, right? And what makes the best positive impact on the patient care? And again, the studies have shown uh, without a doubt that into professional education. So people, students learn this in their programs, either CJEP, college, university level, then it actually improves patient care in the long run and also prevents burnouts. And as we know in today's healthcare system, that is a really a hot topic. Um, and so just imagine if you can prevent burnouts in 20% of your staff, um, this is well worth investing in at the college and university level. And then the next slide is about the competencies and I'm pa passing that on to you. Maria, I think. I think that was, that was your bit, Sharon. <laughs> okay, okay, that's perfect. That's You're doing so well. <laughs> different competencies, sorry. And so we've got the interprofessional, we've got communication, Right, okay, no, so if you can move back to slide seven, please, Andy, thank you. So we've got interpersonal communication. It's all about family um, and patient-centered care. And we have to look at the team functioning and role clarification. So as they can understand better their own role in the profession, obviously then they can function better as a team, right? And we, want, and we talk about collective leadership. And so your team functions only as the best, as the weakest link. Right, and so if you can get everybody on board to be at a higher level, then you will function better as a team. And we do a whole other part about conflict resolution, which um, is, I think that's part is Mariev. <laughs> so thank you very much. All right, we can move on to the next slide. So um, this ties into what Sharon was uh, just explaining. I, I like how you, you said, uh, Sharon, how, uh, working collectively can help prevent burnout. We certainly um, see, you know, in the field right now of health and social services that um, our professionals are working in contexts that are more and more complex, um, a number of various health issues and compounded health issues um, and, and complexity in terms of the care that's needed for the patients. So the importance of, um, of this collective uh, work with, within a team of professionals um, is more than ever uh, essential for, for professionals' um, um, satisfaction at work, but also, as Sharon said, for the best care to the patient. So when we're looking at collective competence, um, basically we're relying a lot on, on the study and research from Laura Lingard, who has spent much of her career studying how teams function um, and how um, trying to understand how a group of highly competent professionals can be incompetent in the work that they do uh, collectively for a patient. Um, so one of the concerns that was um, 
uh, addressed by her research was that a lot of uh, our educational system is based on training people to be highly specialized in their own discipline, which of course is important. We want to train professional um, uh, people who have a, a, a solid professional background. We want people to be very competent within their disciplines. As, as you all know, in, in our college uh, competencies, every program has very specific competencies that must be achieved for students to graduate. That being said, um, they can be extremely competent in their own domain, but then if they're placed in a team with other professionals and they have a misunderstanding or make assumptions about how these other professionals function, then we have a problem in terms of how services are delivered to the patient and how care is delivered to the patient. Um, so we could see situations where we might have one patient who has many professionals uh, working with them on, a, on particular health issues. They may have several health issues, yet um, they may find themselves in situations where they're getting either contradictory information, where they're not getting the full care that they need based on all the aspects of their health and their, the global aspects of their health, including mental health. Um, and so um, that there can be ruptures in the services that are provided, which really heavily impact on the patient. Uh, we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, so Lorelai Lingard describes the situation where a patient might be sort of finding themselves with a lot of gaps in their care as a maze of disconnected care episodes, which she ties to lack of communication between the professionals involved in, um, in a, a patient's care um, and services and where professionals, again, are working in isolation. Um, and we see this a lot in, in the field because um, time constraints, heavy uh, caseloads, heavy patient um, situations. Um, and so we find uh, a lot of professionals being very isolated in the work that they do. And this is obviously um, contributing to uh, burnout, as, as we talked about, um, and then also impacting the quality of services and care that's provided to the patient. So the, the goal of collective competence, and this is something we'll explain a little bit more in terms of the activities that we've created, um, is really to be able to have a group of highly competent professionals be competent as a team, uh, competent in their communication, competent in their ability to reach out to each other, and also in their ability to understand um, their specific roles and how those roles um, are interdependent. So it's really a sense of working interdependently rather than working completely independently. We can move. Um, so our dilemma in terms of the IPE activities and, and considering this notion of collective competence and looking at all of the other um, IPE competencies um, that we want to address, um, we, we were trying to see how what kinds of activities can we uh, create that are as authentic as possible uh, to prepare our students um, for the world, the real world out there, to, to prepare them for their clinical practice in the field. Um, so how do we do that, right? How do we create these activities that will seem very realistic to them and are at the same time relatable to them um, and being mindful of the specificity of each of their disciplines? Um, so we've created opportunities for them to learn and we've, you, you'll see we've created various activities that either um, will combine two disciplines, three disciplines, or the seven health and social service disciplines we have at Dawson, which is a much bigger feat. Uh, we, we've managed to do it and we'll explain how we did that. Um, but we definitely felt that we needed to bring authenticity to these activities so that students then, when they graduate, can, can relate to that and, and recall those experiences and apply them in their practice. So how do we do this in the context of uh, a program is really making sure that we're touching upon common uh, learning objectives. So we do look at our competencies over the seven disciplines and look at what are some commonalities between those competencies uh, and how we can link them together. Um, and also to look at how we can sustain this um, process, right? And so making sure that IPE is not just a passing project, but that it's something that's sustainable within our programs. Um, so really trying to integrate uh, IPE as part of our programs, um, so creating it as, as, a, as a specific entity within our programs. And we are seeing now also with revision of our programs how um, we've really in incorporated IPE as part of uh, our new programs as well. So all these, these changes that are being made really incorporating IPE so that it does remain embedded uh, in the work that we do with our students. I'll just add, if it's okay, um, yeah. 
a little another story from uh, from the work that we've done. So I'll put some timestamps to all of this. So right now, as we started to look at the two main things of what is interprofessional education and what is collective competence and knowing the experience of all of us across the sector as teachers who either still work in the healthcare sector or now teach, obviously, in the healthcare sector um, or any combination of the two, depending on the semester, we knew that it was very vital that we give these opportunities to students. In addition, it's the concept of we're looking at team functioning, conflict, communication in our silos. So how is that helpful? How is it helpful if in a nursing course we're talking about here's how to function in a multidisciplinary team, but you're only working with nursing students? So I remember at the time, about after about a year of doing some research and looking at all the, the, the literature, I remember specifically attending all of the department meetings with so much enthusiasm. And my approach to the teams was let's meet on a weekly basis, to which I was looked at like as if this is going to happen. There's zero time. So not only are we facing ourselves with a massive dilemma or a difficult dilemma of we're doing this right now in all of our silos in the constructs of a program, there's not a lot of time and movability or ways to massage what's going on in our course offerings, especially if the teams aren't on board. And so in addition to what we've written here, another thing I think that's important to bring up, and this is that story aspect, it really is getting the right people involved. And you'll see we have some of these lessons learned later on, but it's hard not to share one of those now. Finding the right people, like the people I'm working with today and presenting with today, in addition to the many others that have been involved throughout the years, is a critical piece to helping the momentum of this type of initiative move forward. And the last thing I'll say before I pass the baton back to, I think it's Krista next, is it's not just the faculty and the technologists that work within our programs, the pedagogical counselors, the deans, the additional people that can help support this kind of project uh, move forward because it does take time and it's okay that it takes time. It's important that it takes time. Go ahead, Krista, I think, right? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so we, we know where we want to be, but in order to get there, we have to take a couple steps back and we have to kind of think of um, what are the objectives that we have and how are we going to attain them? So um, if we look at our first step, <laughs> We want to think of what is interprofessional education, but specifically for Dawson College. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So this is actually a picture of students in their first year. Um, it was a, a activity that was done for role clarification um, between physiotherapy technology, social service, there was radiation oncology as well, and I believe diagnostic imaging. Um, so all of these students were able to get together and learn with, from, and about each other. Um, they learned about their particular, um, what are the differences between their particular disciplines, but also specifically, what are the commonalities um, between their disciplines? And what that really fostered was a amazing relationship across all of the students, and not only across the students, but also I can say that I've created some great relationships with all of the other teachers that I've been able to um, meet and collaborate with through these particular activities. Um, so I think it's important to say who we are. I know we've mentioned a couple of the, the disciplines as we've gone about, but we are very lucky at Dawson to have seven medical technology and social service disciplines. Um, I will ra rattle them off now and I will make sure that I remember them all. <laughs> we have diagnostic imaging technology. We have ultrasound technology, biomedical laboratory technology, radiation oncology, physiotherapy technology, nursing, and social service. So knowing that we have that many disciplines at Dawson, it's been a challenge, but also very interesting to be able to create certain activities that either embed all of those seven disciplines or at least just small um, disciplines within them. 
So now that we know who we are, that we want to build those relationships, we have our step number two. So now we know what we want to do. We need to actually determine a framework to test how are we going to implement these activities. So we are very lucky to have a student of ours in the physiotherapy tech um, department uh, named Naman Mohammed, who um, was very open to kind of being our guinea pig. <laughs> um, we kind of went to him and said, this is the project that we're wanting to create. We were wanting to kind of um, start coming up with different cases that we could use for interprofessional education. Um, and he is a student that is open with his um, type 1 diabetes. So we thought it would be a really good way to kind of interview him, but have multiple disciplines um, interview him, such as social service and nursing. So by getting all of this footage, we were able to really decide what can we do with this footage um, and what type of cases or activities could we build around it. So the dilemma with getting all of this footage was that what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do we find the case, the person, build that up and then find the perfect activity um, and design where it would fit in? Or do we need to go find where there's that opportunity to collaborate, design an activity, and then find the right case? Um, so that's kind of where we've landed on more of a framework of how to design IPE activities. Um, so it's in that bullseye type of design. Um, and I know it's tiny, but in the middle, <laughs> the most important thing that you can see is that it all came down to logistics. Um, it was very difficult to design an activity if there wasn't that overlap that was seen in any of the programs either in their schedule or if it was seen in all the same types of um, semesters. So we kind of looked at logistics and then we moved outwards. Um, so this is the framework that we've used um, it, with multiple of our activities. So we have tested this framework um, and it's one that we found has been uh, very helpful as we move forward. Great, I think it's my turn again. And so as we created opportunities to test some of these um, things, as Krista said, logistical challenges. That was our number one um, thing to uh, overcome and surmount. And so what worked really well is if you had a class and a time that matched with another discipline, then you hit the jackpot. Then it's very easy to create an interprofessional activity. Uh, if you didn't, as Tim and I can relate, we spent hours and hours and hours trying to figure out how we can get, like, let's say, nursing students or physio tech just for a three hour block. Um, it took, <laughs> it felt like months. So again, if you can find that hurdle that will just disappear if you have the matching class time and day, then, and then the next thing will be willing teachers to come on board and collaborate together. Um, the next thing we had when we were uh, creating some of these activities was uh, about managing team conflict. And at the beginning, in our first iteration of it, um, I can just say that my students threw the other discipline under the bus and blamed them for miscommunication. So of course we realized that was not what we wanted our students to graduate with. So as we uh, managed to educate them more and how to work as a team and to manage the team conflict, then they moved into the position of accepting responsibility as a team and then finding the solution within the team. Um, so already we could just see anecdotally that um, that was, we had come a long way with that. Uh, we also use things like simulation. So again, um, as the next picture will show, we have uh, Tim acting the part of the scenario. And so basically he's role playing a elderly gentleman uh, with dementia. And so whenever we have these scenarios, then there's usually some kind of trigger that happens along the way. Like either someone, the patient falls or one of the scenarios, there was an anaphylactic shock or the patient becomes really angry and agitated. And then we have to have the team in this case, it's the physiotechnologist and 
the social services and how do they then come along together as a team to de-escalate the situation or regulate the situation in the way that's best for the patient. Um, the other things we introduced um, with this group was uh, motivational interviewing, which again was very, very high in social services, but in physiotherapy technology, nursing, it's not um, as prevalent in the program. And so we really managed to introduce a large component of um, uh, just assessing where the patient is and what is it that's limiting them from moving to the next stage. So things like open-ended questions, affirmation, um, reflection, and summarizing uh, were all things that the students learned. And because uh, social services were so much more advanced in that, all the rest of the students could learn off from them. And so again, that was a great uh, team building um, and learning about each other's profession and the strengths of each other's professions. Um, and then we learned things about cultural safety and basically just being aware of the inequalities that are out there in the health system and how do we adapt ourselves um, to be better equipped to, um, to manage that. And so this was the first time we had done this one with social services and it was a big success. And I think both sides of the students, when we looked in their journals and their feedback, there was a lot of positive uh, um, reinforcement. And I think it will, they had said that they know now that this will follow them into their careers. And just anecdotally, then some of them said when they went back into their placements, rather than the hospital long-term care setting, they actually had the courage then to speak to nursing, to speak to social services that were there in the hospital, the long-term care sitting, because they knew, they had the confidence now, they knew how to approach them. And so already we just saw positive um, feedback. I think that's my part. And Krista, back to you. Um, so the next example we're gonna talk about is one that was extremely collaborative with many, many teachers across all of those seven disciplines, um, because this was a case that we um, brought up that actually was able to um, hit every single one of those seven um, programs that we have. Um, so it was the interprofessional case study, the Sarah Lynn breast cancer journey. So it, the story actually follows Sarah Lynn from her diagnosis into her remission. Um, and through her actual story and her experience, she touches on every single one of the disciplines that we have at Dawson. Um, so what we were able to do is that's a lot of students to bring together. So if we look at logistics, it wasn't actually possible to bring all that number of students together. So we thought, how are we going to do it? We actually used Moodle. Um, as our like main home for this. So students were, all the students from all the seven disciplines were broken up into specific Moodle teams um, where they first had to do kind of a questionnaire of how they think a breast cancer journey looks like. And then once they finished that, they were able to actually watch um, a video of Sarah Lynn, the, the actor presenting her case study. Um, and through this, they kind of learned where each discipline came into the patient's story. And then the second part that really jumped in was that each discipline was now challenged with creating a four to five minute video outlining what that particular discipline would do in that particular instance of her story. Um, so all the students had to work on this in their simultaneous courses. Um, and then they got to post all of their videos. So then the students were then asked to watch one video that followed the flow of Sarah Lynn's journey. Um, and having taught one of those courses that it was involved in, it was kind of an amazing thing to see it all come together. Um, and then to kind of culminate the activity, um, we had, uh, as you can see here, kind of a crossword puzzle that again was generated in Moodle where a lot of the questions came directly from the videos. So if students took the time and watched the videos, they were then able to finish off um, the crossword puzzle. And we actually, how I implemented it in my course was that they were put in their teams that they actually produced their videos in. 
Um, so it was very even kind of team-based learning. It was interprofessional, but we were still in our own separate ways. But I know that there was multiple times that students, um, after they had this opportunity, got together and it was a very big talking point because I believe that um, it was a very important activity for the students to experience. Okay, so I'll move on to another activity we actually just uh, completed last month. Um, so the Sarah Lynn case that uh, Krista was presenting had students from the seven disciplines involved working asynchronously. In this case, with the IPE, we managed to gather all of the seven disciplines together in one space, um, which logistically seemed impossible, but we managed uh, through college resources, uh, through Tim's great uh, social skills and in, in talking to a lot of people who can help us with these, uh, these various elements uh, to be able to gather um, everyone in a theater. We do have access to the Pepsi Forum where we have classrooms, but we're able to, um, to rent uh, the theater to be able to gather everyone. Um, and so this was a full day activity that was uh, proposed to the seven disciplines and um, was uh, essentially replacing um, clinical time or clinical practice for most of the students and a few uh, for a few programs that it was replacing um, actual uh, class time. Uh, so this particular activity required obviously some planning and anticipation and preparation of all of the teachers involved. So we had to really work on the buy-in from the teachers to be able to integrate the activity into their uh, class or course schedule. Um, so we had the seven disciplines and focused on conflict resolution and collective competence for this particular edition. This was our second edition last November. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that we, we really were able to integrate a lot of the feedback we received from students um, the previous year um, and really focused on allowing the opportunity for students to share their clinical experiences. Um, because we realized that, you know, they're all in the field, they're all doing clinicals um, and uh, again, don't necessarily have the confidence or um, ability to go out and reach out to other disciplines while they're in the field. So this allowed them really to ask questions in um, you know, a low stakes environment. Uh, they were all uh, grouped into um, interprofessional teams uh, for the activity. So we had some um, didactic presentations, including one on conflict resolution, and then students were broken up into um, breakout rooms uh, to have their own work sessions in their teams. And of course, we don't have an equal number of students in every discipline, but we tried to really mix them as much as possible. So they, they were given time to exchange on their own experiences, on some of the challenges they face, but also to ask each other questions about what it is that they do really in the day to day. What is it that's specific about their discipline? Um, and, and so to be able to really um, make it more relatable for them. Um, so we had them organized again in, in those groups and working also on uh, a case study. Um, and so there were different parts to the day. They also were entertained. We had our uh, theater students, uh, our graduates, I should say, from Dawson who presented skit on um, workplace conflict uh, to get them sort of into that uh, way of thinking. So we, we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so um, again, uh, the seven disciplines which I put in the in the chat uh, were combined. Uh, so we were able to um, allow them to have this experience together. Uh, this is their fifth semester, so uh, close to their graduating uh, semester. Um, so really um, in a situation where they've experienced uh, clinical um, uh, hours and, and uh, field hours and are able to bring that experience back to the classroom. Um, also looking at what are some common concerns, what are some challenges that they face in the field. Um, and then again, um, applying the concepts that they learned in the didactic presentations in terms of conflict resolutions to those experiences in the field and exploring how they might resolve various conflicts that either they're involved in or have witnessed um, in the field. Um, and so that was sort of the first part of the day. The second part was looking at um, a particular case and looking at various missteps that occurred in this particular case of a patient in a hospital, a patient who had cancer um, and um, whose, um, whose care episodes were ruptured by a number of challenges and a number of um, of errors or missteps uh, and lack of communication and also conflict between the professionals. So we really expose the students to um, this particular situation, which of course is quite realistic in the context that we're in now and looking at how they would address this. How would they um, go about 
uh, first of all, explaining and understanding the conflict that occurred, and then how would they go about resolving it to ensure that um, no other patient would experience this type of challenge within their care. Um, so that's the, the event per se. I'm sorry I'm going on and on. It, it was a very exciting um, opportunity. Um, the challenge, of course, again, is logistics, finding the actual day to do this. We managed to fit it into our calendar and also really reaching out to a lot of college resources, um, including other uh, initiatives um, and programs that were able to help us. We talked about the professional theater program getting involved, as well as other resources. We have Sustainable Dawson, who uh, generously provided some gifts for our participants. Um, and so really to create a full day event that is low stakes, so there's no grades attached to it. Um, we really wanted to be a, a, a valuable and low stress experiential exercise for the students. Um, and we, of course, ask for feedback. And so this allows us to also adapt and modify as we go. Okay, this was our second edition. We're already thinking about how to improve our, our third edition. So I believe it's me. I think so. Yes, I'm sorry. I just cut that very short. But I just good. realized I was maybe taking too much time. No, no, it's perfect. Um, we have about five more minutes uh, of a of content to go through, and then we'll have some time for some questions, uh, and so on. So I'll finish up here by just taking us a step back a little bit. We designed that bullseye, and we've tested it many times, and it's again we find it to be quite strong of a tool that we feel comfortable to say is usable in our sector and other sectors at other colleges, other medical technology and, and health sectors at other colleges. But in addition, we feel comfortable to say that it's a tool that you can use when designing any type of activity that brings together two disciplines or two programs that aren't scheduled to do these types of activities. So the, the fabulous CGEP system that we have does graduate students who are quite competent in disciplines. And this is something that I think can be used across any program, uh, any technology program through your technology program. Um, but our tool, our framework is a usable approach when looking at designing opportunities that bring students together. Examples that might occur, I'm no expert, however, I feel like if I'm a graphic designer and a photographer, or if I'm, in, if I'm in graphic design and photography, there might be an opportunity for those teachers to initiate learning opportunities for those students to collaborate together, only because it would only help them later on, potentially in their profession, to know more about what each other do so that they can work together. The one asterisk to that framework is the additional benefit when doing these activities in the healthcare sector is that it does benefit the patient. There is research that defends that giving these students these opportunities while they're becoming competent in their profession changes their mindset to think in a more collaborative practice way so that as they add layers in their discipline specific courses, they're also thinking about the big picture when necessary in during intentional tailored opportunities that we provided for them. So that framework has been a great tool for us to develop more than the three activities you heard today. We're now at the point of having this many for the students, which brings us to the concluding comments that we have about, okay, so what is next? We're running these activities at our school. We're having the students have these opportunities to learn with, from, and about each other all the while learning more about what helps in the design of these activities. We've also discovered and landed on creative ways around some of these logistical barriers. As an example, using Moodle so the students can collaborate virtually, designing a full day activity where the students are removed from their clinical experiences and thrown into a learning opportunity together to some of the more um, less high stakes, more straightforward opportunities. Example, when they arrive at Dawson in their first semester and participate in orientation, we organize with the school that all of the students in the sector participate together. And we design ac an activity for them from the start before they even start a single course that they're interacting with this larger group of students and not just within their discipline. 
So the next step for us as a school is to figure out the effectiveness of what we're doing. Is it helping them become more collaborative practice ready? Are we helping them develop some collaborative uh, competence skills and mindset? So that's on the horizon for us. In addition, we do really want to take a step back and say, where are the other opportunities that we can design these uh, activities for students to interact? So again, that they are tailored, intentional, and value the importance of them being in a room together and having their voices heard. If we knew right away from the start, it's not an opportunity to collect all these students and have us as experts speak to them and teach them. Yes, learning is happening. Yes, we do play a role as facilitators, but the concept that we landed on is learning with, from, and about each other. And that has remained the mission the entire time whenever we hit the ground designing activities, get the students talking together so they can learn with, from, and about each other. And so what we've designed, and this is very new, <laughs> is this idea of a meta program across these disciplines. The nuance of all the words here is not the main objective of showing you this today. The main objective is if we are able to design the programs so that these all the competencies that are common overlap, like team functioning or communication or conflict, overlap in the semester and in a perfect world overlap deep, even on the same day at the same time in the semester, then the opportunities for the students to learn together increases and the barriers to do these activities diminishes. So that's what we're doing right now with our school to try and be able to design this in hopes that we can obviously implement it within our own building, within our own community, but in addition, provide the rest of the network with the lessons learned, not because we feel like we know everything and we are experts, uh, but more so because we're living this experience and why not share with others, again, the many mistakes that we've done, but also the, the successes that we feel like we've had. So, this is the big question that we're now uh, throwing at the group, I suppose, and um, and heavily, uh, mainly because a lot of our graduates work with a lot of the other graduates from the other sector and vice versa. And so in order to better the entire network and increase the amount of collaborative practice readiness that all of the graduating cohorts have, can't we do a better job wouldn't it be nice if we could all augment these learning opportunities and provide the students with access to opportunities to learn with, from, and about each other? So that brings us to this slide here, but I think before we do a sign-off kind of comment, we'll navigate to the question and answer uh, period. So I will look at open questions. How do you present this IPE approach to your colleagues so they see if they can or want to get involved? How do you sell it to teachers? Do you integrate the gen ed teachers in collaborative evaluations? So I'll take the first swing team to demonstrate collective competence. I'll probably start and then I imagine someone can fill in the gaps. So yes, I can speak from that 2018, 2019 experience where I was sold, I was all in as an individual because the release pattern from the school was in fact that at the, at the time I was the only sort of teacher who had time away from teaching to examine what all this was. And I knew within the first few months that it was gonna take a team, not only because of the concept of interprofessional education, but mostly because you're asking teachers to, in a world where we are quite comfortable in what we're doing, we're quite confident and competent, or at least this is what I can say on behalf of the, of the teachers in what we're doing. So why change? It takes some uh, time to infiltrate the teacher's thinking unless they themselves are ready to take on something, which is not always the case. And so a slow burn, I like to sometimes use the word fester, but I know the nursing team doesn't like that because of the meaning of that word in their world is not a positive word, but the idea of slowly integrating, slowly selling, whether it be a conversation in the hallway, 
frequent opportunities to educate the sector about what this is all about, but also finding those key early adopters to test. So even as early as 2018, there was a social service teacher and a physiotherapy technology teacher who dove in. We said, let's just get the students in the room together and we'll figure it out. And so by finding those two teachers and trying things out, the snowball sort of started to happen. And then they spoke to people and they spoke to people and they spoke to people. The last thing I'll say here is as a, as a culture, I feel confident to say it's really important for us as teachers to be uh, optimistically skeptical when we look at new approaches to teaching. If we always uh, jumped in two feet into the deep end with new approaches to teaching, it would be quite chaotic, I think. I think we become comfortable in what we do. Yet, when you look at some of the things that are out there for us to try and adopt, it's hard not to see this, in my opinion, and it seems like it is now within our school, to see these this approach as a wonderful opportunity to augment, to provide more opportunities for our students to learn. In addition, the concept of the logistics being somewhat taken care of. So as a teacher, when we as a team design an activity and then bring the teacher in who has to implement the activity, I think one of our successes is that process of making, making the activity what we like to call plug and play. Here's everything you need to do, know about what you need to do. And we spend time with them. We do get them involved in the design process of the activity. So in regards to your question of selling, there's lots of little things that can happen uh, that help sell. Hopefully that is a very long answer to your simple question. I hope it covered it. Can I, can um, I just add something? Oh, very quickly, I'm sure. just because I, I, I was thinking as you were saying, um, Tim, I think you, you need to find those teachers who are risk takers and then then they will serve as multipliers in terms of, you know, getting other people engaged. So it, it just takes one person in a team who then shares the experience with their team members, um, gets them on board. And I think um, events, for example, like the symposium, we invite all the teachers to come. So they actually witness what this looks like. Um, they can take part in part of the day, half the day. We really give them flexibility. And as Tim said, um, you know, we prepare them, we give them a whole script that they can use if they're helping to facilitate the activities. We've done a lot of PED Day activities also, uh, thanks to Tim, who's really been able to get us um, spots on our PED Days to be able to present, to get feedback, um, to explain exactly how everything will work and to be able to get people involved so that when the, the activity does happen, then people are feeling more prepared. Um, I saw there was a question earlier about whether or not this could be feasible in, in the humanities, for example. So I don't know if, if any of you have any thoughts about that. Well, in the second half of the other question too, where it was regarding general education. So oh, yes, yeah. So it's kind of tied to together. I'll start again. I don't want to take the floor all the time, but um, I can throw one thing in just sure. for what you were saying for, um, you know, how do you get other teachers in is that a lot of the activities that we designed with, you know, the outline of the project, and yes, we had scripts for, for teachers to follow, but there was also flexibility in, in the way that um, teachers could choose to implement it for the, you know, the Sarah Lynn case, for example. Um, in my particular course, it was more of a low stakes activity. Um, the activity took part in my lab, so it was a lab type of activity. Whereas other teachers saw that as an opportunity to take the video of that assignment and make it into a bigger assignment for their course. So um, it really gave the teachers flexibility to uh, incorporate the particular activity into their course as well. One thing in regards to general education specifically humanities and others, there are opportunities um, at this point, some of the students, some of the, excuse me, my knowledge of the humanities course that every student has to take, I believe it's their last course. There is a project tied specifically to a field of study or a profession that they are hoping to enter. And so there's opportunities that we've linked up with humanities where the students can incorporate some of this approach into that project. 
And in addition, uh, working with their French department, a lot of us work as individual programs with their French department to incorporate learning opportunities and help them uh, perfect or work on their French, given the context of them working in the healthcare sector uh, and the need to be able to navigate as much as possible in, in the two languages. And so we work closely with the French department designing opportunities for the students, uh, so much so that it's on our radar to host a simulation or simulations strictly in French to be able to get them to be exposed to practicing in that language. And, um, and so there's lots of work. It's a little bit more tricky, as you can imagine. Uh, but the program approach at Dawson is quite strong. I have no context to compare it to other CGEPs. But uh, myself, I can speak from experience. I also have workload in phys physical education, so also have worked in general education for many years and have sat in different positions on different program committees. Uh, and at this point, I feel confident to say that our program approach is quite strong. So programs like IPE can benefit from that aspect of, uh, of the system. All right, and it's just gone 1230. So um, if that's all right with uh, the speakers, let's consider those the concluding remarks. Um, thank you so much, uh, Krista, Maria, Sharon, and Tim uh, for sharing these practices, examples, insights. Um, I found them to be very inspiring. I also firmly believe that they're transferable to other CSHEPs and other program families. Um, so hopefully um, this has also inspired um, some of the participants to, to look into this approach. Um, maybe I'd uh, invite you to share an email address or some other type of contact uh, information should uh, somebody wish to continue the, uh, the exchange. And uh, then I will, at the same time, uh, share the link to our appreciation survey. Um, as I said at the beginning of the webinar, it would be much appreciated if you could take uh, a few seconds to share your thoughts. And um, before letting you go, I uh, also want to remind uh, everybody that um, we'll have a major lecture coming up in uh, January, on January 11th, on ungrading by Jesse Stommel. And uh, our journal, Pedagogie Collegiale, is also available in English uh, for your reading enjoyment, uh, but also uh, if you would like to make any uh, proposals for articles in English. So I'll share those links as well. Um, so again, thank you so much uh, to the entire IPE team and uh, have a very nice afternoon, everybody. <laughs>